Welcome to Podcast on Tech Nation. This is a series of podcasts focused specifically on the biomedical and HTM industry. Episodes will be added monthly. Listening to each episode is eligible for one continuing education credit from the ACI. At the conclusion of this episode, you will be able to access a link that will take you to a quick survey. You will be able to download your certificate once you submit the survey. Before we begin today's podcast, I'd like to invite you to save the date for our upcoming MD Expo in Dallas, Texas on April 16th and 17th. You can find more details and registration for the show at mdexposhow.com. In this episode, we are joined by Jonathan Langer, CEO and co-founder of Medigate. Jonathan will reinforce the need for biomedical engineers to have a seat at the table with their security and IT peers when setting their clinical zero trust strategy. This will ensure that access and availability to the devices and settings that provide care are never interrupted. Jonathan, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the Tech Nation podcast. Uh, I'm Jonathan, the CEO of Medigate. Today, I am going to talk about the importance of clinical engineering being part of the dialogue with IT and security peers when discussing a clinical zero trust architecture. So of course, the, the first question that arises is what exactly is zero trust? And then what is clinical zero trust? So I'll start with what zero trust is. And essentially, zero trust is a combination of people, processes, and tools that ensure that only certain users will be able to access certain data and applications on the network based on ultimately user identity. A good example of that would be a physician obviously needs to be able to access the, the EMR in order to store uh, electronic medical records. Uh, but if I'm a family of a patient and I walk into the, to the hospital with my, with my smartphone, of course, I wouldn't need access to the EMR. So essentially, this is a way that if an HDO is attacked and compromised, by a cyber attack, then the ability of the attacker to move laterally within the network would be contained and limited. And that's why it's such an important architecture that many HDOs and many, many enterprises are using today. Clinical zero trust, on the other hand, is in a way a subset of zero trust. And it's different in the sense that the focus of the framework shifts from protection of data only to protection of clinical physical workflows, what we call care protocols, or what the industry calls care protocols. So here we're looking at, for example, how to secure patient monitors that are transmitting data back to a nurse station, perhaps an MRI modality that's sending imaging back to a PAC system, and so on and so forth. And the real importance of looking at clinical zero trust is to make sure that when we use policies on the network, when we enforce them on the network, we're not disrupting clinical workflow at all, given the importance of that for, for the HDOs day to day. So with that being said, the main reason for clinical engineering participation in a clinical a zero trust architecture discussion is ultimately to ensure that access and availability the connected clinical devices will never be interrupted or disrupted. Uh, as a steward of that uh, operational capacity of the, of the medical devices, I think that clinical engineering has a very important seat at the table, which is why I advocate for this. Uh, at the end of the day, health, healthcare is a mission critical environment, and therefore we have to have zero tolerance towards any disruption of clinical workflow. Okay. In this podcast, I'm going to talk about the five main benefits of a clinical zero trust strategy for the clinical engineering department that may be even ancillary to the actual security capabilities that I talked about. With that being said, I will start.
So first and foremost, I'll start with visibility, better visibility into everything connected and specifically for clinical engineering, that would be the biomedical devices is of course a great benefit. Now the connection to, to zero trust is that if you are going to ongoingly implement a zero trust strategy, that must be predicated on a detailed real-time inventory of all the devices and network communications within the HDO network. Ultimately, this visibility can lead to better management and security for all the hospital's assets. Now, what that visibility may include is details on the make, the model, the serial number, the communication protocols, embedded software versions, locations of the devices, and ultimately for clinical engineering, the importance in my eyes is the ability to make data-driven decisions that improve the efficiency of the hospital's operations. I'll start with one example that's more on the security side. So if I have better visibility into the, the medical devices, then I'm gonna be able to constantly track vulnerabilities, indicators of compromise, recalls, and so on, and map them to the inventory of the health of the health system itself. This would even be easier if all the data is, of course, inputted into the, the CMMS platform that clinical engineering uses. Now, what this would allow, if it's done digitally, is it would allow teams to be more efficient and effective in their patching and vulnerability management plans, as well as, honestly, even in the routine uh, preventive maintenance activities. So that's one main benefit that we could get out of a better visibility. Another example that I'll circle back to at the end of this uh, podcast is actually around, uh, revolves around utilization. So if the visibility can also transform into detailed data describing the degree of utilization of various medical device fleets, that could potentially improve the operational efficiency within the HDO as it pertains to the usage of these medical devices. So good example would be insights into how devices are being used and the level of, the, of utilization. That could improve procurement decisions. Uh, determining maintenance windows, when is the right time with the least amount of disruption uh, to actually uh, conduct uh, PM activities. And also determine when the, the appropriate end of life of the device should be based on the overall available inventory and financial constraints. Now, if these kinds of decisions are based on credible data rather than intuition, our ability to reach better outcomes is, of course, a, a much, much better. And I get excited about this because in my eyes, the ability to revolutionize CE's role, clinical engineering's role, uh, through championing operational efficiency using this data it is a very novel approach that I'd certainly love to see used uh, in many healthcare systems. Uh, so that's the first bit. Uh, and just to recap, that would be better visibility that allows us to digitally manage security, uh, but also to obtain insights into operational efficiency. I'll move on to the second piece, which is improved collaboration and orchestration within the, the HDO. Now, the reality is, is that clinical engineering, clinical engineering cannot protect the care protocols, the medical devices without the information security team, which is ultimately charged with this in many cases, but also vice versa. Security needs clinical engineering in order to implement the clinical zero trust uh, strategy, uh, and also to apply remediation, uh, patching, and so on, uh, that actually requires maintenance of the device and, and, and to actually touch the device. Now, what happens is a, as a byproduct of the discussion around the zero trust strategy, the departments actually work much closer as a team. Um, Typically, or in, in some cases at least, there's somewhat of a silo because everyone is in their own lane and doing their own thing and have their own legacy and processes and sometimes separate leadership. Um, but when we actually engage in discussion around zero trust, we're finally talking the same language, sharing the same 
objective, which is ultimately protecting patients. And then the, the magic begins to happen. And in my eyes, that magic is interdepartmental silos can finally be broken down and real productive working relationships between teams can finally be forged. And it, what that means ultimately is that plans and decisions around defining security groups, a, the pertinent security policies can actually be discussed within the parameters of the care protocol. So now we're having back to the, the, the initial example that I gave, now the discussion is around how to secure a patient monitor that's transmitting a data back to a nurse station, or how do we take care of an MRI that is sending pictures back to the images, back to the packs, and so on. And it's not just diving into the tech talk to begin with. We're talking about the essence, which is defining the security groups, defining the policies, the care protocol, and ultimately ensuring that all the priorities are aligned between clinical engineering and the security team. Um, Again, to reiterate the importance of clinical engineering within this, uh, within this discussion, it's definitely the understanding of those care protocols, which is the realm of this, certainly in the realm of clinical engineering, but perhaps even uh, more importantly, making sure that those care protocols, those clinical workflows are not disrupted uh, in any shape or form when we apply this uh, zero, clinical zero trust architecture a ultimately, that is a, certainly a, a clinical engineering priority in that regard. Um, the reality is that both, as I said, clinical engineering and security are stakeholders in this zero trust initiative, and it just uh, it just certainly moves them together. Uh, I think that a big part of such an initiative, or a, frankly, a, a first step that I would take to ensure a success, is also to form the right governance structure even before you dive into the actual tech and actual um, a security of uh, security notions is to create a good governance structure. Now that could be an interdepartmental task force. It could be some sort of oversight committee. There are many, many ways to go about this and many HDOs do this uh, differently based on their structure and based on their uh, legacy and history and culture and so on. Uh, but ultimately, the objective of this uh, governance structure would be to make sure that there's a great line of communication between stakeholders from clinical engineering, IT, and information security. Without the right governance model and without the right lines of communication, uh, it's going to be really hard to implement clinical zero trust. So I would certainly encourage starting right there. So just to recap that, a great byproduct of clinical zero trust is actually to improve the collaboration and orchestration within the uh, within the HDO, essentially bringing clinical engineering, IT, and IS closer together. Next part that I wanted to next benefit that I wanted to uh, underscore is value-based care. Now we all know that connected medicine is critical to what we call value-based care delivery that is ultimately aimed to reduce costs and improve patient outcomes. In this uh, post-COVID era, the reality we live in is clearly one that is embracing networked care delivery. And that's evident in explosion in spending on IOMT in the acute space and the non-acute space. It's evident in what we're seeing around telemedicine and RPM. And in this context, Zero trust is, is certainly an enabler. Uh, many HDOs and many healthcare facilities are struggling or are concerned about the security implications of moving to connected care um, because of the, of the cybersecurity threats that we're seeing everywhere. And zero trust in that sense can really be an enabler to move forward faster. Now, what, what's happening is that when we develop a zero trust strategy, Healthcare, system is, healthcare systems can essentially engineer their care delivery networks to maximize two things. The first would be robustness of the, of the overall security program, but the other piece would actually be the agility of the service delivery, meaning that it means that when a new device is onboarded or provisioned, 
that can be done easily through a security ready process that's certainly something that we would want as we onboard more and more connected devices we would want that process to be streamlined in order to be on the one hand secure but on the other hand just to be able to done to be to be able to be executed with as little friction as possible now what we're envisioning as part of the clinical zero trust uh, approach is that the network itself should take care of the security aspect of course we still want to see security on, embedded on the device itself and a lot of that is of course on the the shoulders of the medical device manufacturers and we certainly want to encourage that to continue but the network itself that already has a, a zero trust architecture enforced is certainly going to be a very crucial layer of security uh, that we are going to have uh, on the network itself. Now, as I said, this approach can expedite the adoption of connected care. And I'd say even more importantly, provide leadership with the confidence to sponsor and prioritize the connected care approach. So just summarizing this third benefit around value-based care is actually through zero trust, we're expediting and uh, contributing to the overall proliferation of the connected care uh, approach, which of course the benefits it, of this approach are, are clear. Uh, and of course, everyone wants to see this implemented. The next point that I wanted to touch upon is I guess the more trivial point and it's attack mitigation. Uh, but I do want to go a little bit deeper here so that everyone understands uh, the benefits uh, uh, the benefits of, the, of uh, from a cybersecurity perspective. Now, the whole point, as I was saying, of implementing a zero trust strategy is to improve the healthcare system security stance. Now, when we implement control points to protect these care protocols, the environment is inherently more resilient, more impervious to attacks. And that's what we're trying to accomplish from a security standpoint. But I do want to go a little bit deeper to, to explain what that means. Successful attacks will be discovered and prevented from propagating, which greatly limits an incidence damage uh, potential. So examples of, a, of potential damage can be a stolen sensitive data, PHI, PII, financial data, a, maybe even a devices that are a, shut down via ransomware, et cetera. And that's what we want to stop. The reality today is that all healthcare systems or all enterprises a, in, in that regard are attacked. The, the trick or the, the objective is of course to stop these attacks as soon as possible before there's lateral movement that's conducted by the attacker that allows them to reach repositories that can contain these sensitive information or to reach these critical uh, assets or, or medical devices that, that we were talking about. So the zero trust architecture, what it does, it helps healthcare systems contain the damage that cyber attacks already have, that, that cyber attacks have on the HDO. So even if the, the, the HDO is compromised or a certain part of the HDO is compromised, it is going to be, the attack is going to be limited to a certain segment, to a certain device, to a very small uh, part of the overall network that limits the attacker's capability to gain, um, to gain more information and to obstruct the, 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 the clinical care itself. So just recapping that, in essence, zero trust architecture or clinical zero trust architecture is all about limiting the options that an attacker has once he has that initial foothold within the network and to that to that end zero trust is probably the best way to go and can really stop the attacker as soon as possible now i want to move on to the fifth benefit or the last benefit of a, employing a zero trust architecture and this goes back to efficiencies. What's gonna happen when we define the care protocols and the zero trust approach, hospitals are going to be forced to take a good and hard look at what they're doing and how they're operating from a security standpoint, but also a clinical engineering standpoint. It's highly likely, and this always happens, uh, we've seen this many times, that inefficiencies and opportunities for improvement will be uncovered. 
And that can lead to progress and advances in how the hospital runs and the overall quality of care. Now, I'll start with a security standpoint. When we, when we employ a zero trust architecture and have that good hard look at the overall security architecture, we're gonna find or uncover chances to consolidate multiple disparate systems and controls and legacy security products. And also, quite frankly, streamline operations that lead to reduced management costs. So that's a, that's a big push from a security standpoint where we're gonna see um, more efficiency and more ROI. From a CE standpoint, I'll go back to, to the first comment that I had made, um, and that is through the, the example that I gave about visibility, and basically through this enhanced visibility and, and most importantly, the utilization metrics of the equipment, the clinical equipment, that can radically change the way that we make decisions around procurement of medical devices, displacement, and ultimately optimal allocation of devices based on patient intake and other priorities that we're seeing in the HDO. Um, and as I said uh, to begin with, I think that's the, that's the part that excites me the most from a clinical engineering lens. Um, so just to recap the, the five benefits before we move on to the next uh, uh, section is we want to obtain through a clinical zero trust architecture, better visibility, that's important for CE, but also important for security. Number two, we're gonna have improved collaboration and orchestration around the, uh, the, the different uh, stakeholders within the HDO, essentially bringing clinical engineering, IT, and information security uh, closer. Uh, we're going to be advocates of value-based care. That's number three. Uh, so the overall clinical zero trust approach is going to give leadership the confidence they need uh, to make advances in value-based care, connected care. Number four would be attack mitigation, of course, the, the security value of employing a zero trust uh, architecture, which stops an attacker uh, only in a, in a limited silo within the network. And number five would be efficiencies. And again, just to, just to re-emphasize, those would be efficiencies from a security standpoint, and also from a clinical engineering standpoint. Thank you very much for that. And with that being said, I will give it back to Jennifer for some questions. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Our, our first question is, will clinical zero trust make it harder or easier to onboard new devices? Perfect. That's a great question. In fact, I get I get that question a lot. Um, in, there are two ways that two things that I wanted to say about this. Um, first and foremost, enhanced visibility, which is of course a, one of the foundations of clinical zero trust, along with the automated policies, automated security policies, essentially make it easier uh, to onboard new devices because now hospitals are able to identify and track the device inventory in a much more detailed and automated manner. So in that regard, I think the, the byproduct of clinical zero trust outside of security is that onboarding is much, much easier. And that's, that's certainly a clinical engineering benefit right there. Um, on a more strategic level, I also think that clinical zero trust will give the HDO leadership the confidence to pursue connected care initiatives, it, which of course has a, a positive impact on, on cost and patient outcomes. It, so we're gonna see um, more motivation from leadership to actually onboard uh, new devices, whether it's telehealth or other types of devices, now that this, uh, now that this uh, a zero trust architecture is in play. Thank you. Our next question is, is clinical zero trust something that is only for big hospitals with big budgets? Perfect. So my sincere answer would be not necessarily. And what I mean by that is that although a clinical zero trust is definitely a more advanced initiative, it can also be used or employed in smaller hospitals, but if it's done right. 
And what I mean by done right is that if you go through a, a process a, that is a carefully orchestrated, that'll lead you from, that will start from strategy and the governance models that I, that I talked about earlier, and then carefully move into implementation where roles and responsibilities within the HDOs are, are well-defined, that's doing it right. And that's where smaller hospitals can also have the opportunity to, uh, to, to employ this strategy. Now, once it's done, uh, as I was saying throughout the podcast, clinical zero trust can certainly drive efficiency by reducing the number of tools, by making them more efficient, uh, by showing stronger ROI um, through the clinical engineering initiatives and so on. So there's actually ROI that you get back when you employ clinical zero trust. But again, I would say candidly that it has to be done right in order for this to be successful. All right, our next question is, how do I get started with clinical zero trust? High level, can you walk us through the process to get it in place and start seeing the benefits? Perfect. Um, so I'd start by saying that there's there's a lot of great material out there uh, about zero trust. So I would certainly get educated um, before starting the initiative. Good example is Forrester's the 2021 playbook uh, for zero trust. It gives you more insights about the, the process and in pretty good detail. Um, once you're educated and you know you know what the, the process entails, the next thing that I would do is to gain corporate sponsorship. Um, as I was saying throughout the podcast, this is an initiative that requires multiple stakeholders from IT, from information security, uh, and of course also from clinical engineering. So we, we do need executive sponsorship. After we have that, I would definitely start with governance. Before jumping into the tools and the technology and the enforcement and all the fun parts, um, we have to start with governance. And regardless, as I was saying previously, in my opinion, regardless of the governance structure that you ultimately select, the number one requirement in my eyes is to have a proper communication path between the stakeholders. Uh, that's what you need to achieve. If, there's not, if, there's, if the communication is not there, uh, it's gonna be hard to execute. Uh, so I would, I would definitely start uh, right, right, right there on the governance side. Now, once the governance piece is, is, uh, is in place, I would work closely to plan, to carefully plan uh, the process to assign roles and responsibilities. And this is where it gets into the, the nitty gritty and more of the, um, on the technical side. And just because we, we, this isn't the, the topic of this webinar, uh, I would certainly look into this further and a, a Medigate team member can certainly get on a separate call uh, and, and help out with this. But I can't stress enough that understanding the operational process of how to do this, how important it is before jumping into the actual technology and the actual usage of the, uh, of the various tools. Um, making sure that the, pro that the right process is in place, it'll just make the overall process, the chances of success higher, and it'll make the process shorter. So I would definitely, definitely, definitely uh, st spend time there. I've seen some pitfalls where folks were really keen on showing progress through and enforcing policies using their, their firewall or NAC or, or, whatever the, or whatever they wanted to use for that it, before the process was in place. And while that showed some, some early signs of success, ultimately the overall initiative was not successful because the process was not well-defined. Um, so I think that's, a, that's understandable. Um, after you have that in place, I would look into tools. Uh, I would definitely use a tool that is able to see IoT devices, IT devices, medical devices, clinical assets in your inventory, a tool that, that is able to automate all this um, and to look comprehensively at everything connected within the HDO uh, and then walk through uh, the process that I described previously. All right, our last question, Jonathan, is what is the risk of not following the process? 
that you just laid out? So I would say that the main risk of not going through this uh, clinical zero trust uh, process is staying reactive from a security standpoint. And ultimately, that in my eyes, that puts the HDO at risk because it lets the bad actors take the initiative. Uh, the cyber attackers are going to attack. We see that uh, all the time, especially in healthcare, unfortunately. Um, and we're kind of letting them uh, take the initiative without the, a proactive approach that is zero trust. I would definitely advocate for that active approach. A clinical zero trust, in my eyes, is a really good framework to create a networking policy that functions across the board to all services within the HDO. And at the same time, we're also gonna get that side benefit of increasing efficiencies, whether it's in security or on the clinical engineering side of the house. Uh, so, it's, it's, so, so there are benefits outside of the security itself, but within the security lens, it is, in my opinion, the best uh, active approach uh, to, uh, to employ uh, when looking at the threats that we're seeing today in healthcare. Thank you, Jonathan, for a great presentation, and thank you to our audience for tuning in. If you enjoyed today's episode, you might enjoy our ongoing webinar series, Webinar Wednesday. You can, you can find a calendar of upcoming live webinars as well as an archive of on-demand webinars at webinarwednesday.live. To obtain your continuing education credit from the ACI, please remember to click the link located below this podcast title to complete today's survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinars at mdpublishing.com.